If you know me, you know I love growing things. And I put a lot of time and effort in doing so, but you know what, it's all worth it. Over the years, I've garnered tips that I love to share with you to make it a little easier. But we can never forget some of those little workers that are always behind the scenes that help me. Flowers that are visited more often by bees will produce a larger yield and more uniform fruit. That's why all of these hardworking little friends are always welcome in the gardens and particularly in the orchard. Arlie, I know you're crazy about growing all kinds of fruit just like I am. You know, I try to get as many folks interested in growing some apples and pears and peaches or whatever in their home gardens. And one of the big questions I think is pollination. How many trees should I have? Can, do I need two of one variety or two of two different varieties? What's your take on it? Well, you, you pose an excellent question. And the truth is it varies with the species and the variety. Apples are self-incompatible, except crab apples. Crab apples have that tendency to be self-fruitful. I see, they but, can pollinate but, themselves, yes, in other words. and right? they can also pollinate the standard apple trees. Well, and that's why we have this tree here. I planted 14 of these. This is, as you know, prairie fire. Yep. It's an old variety. Old one, very that, nice. And it has a beautiful pink bloom on it. And I planted it because I thought it would help our fruit set with all our other apples. Yes, that's very true. And of course, uh, you've got the sort of natural pollination, but then we, we love the help we can get from our friends, the insects. In our area, we have honeybees and we have some hives. They are pollinating today, I can tell you. And believe it or not, even a carpenter bee that messes with your house and does all that bad stuff. <laughs> They'll do a little pollinating. They will well. do a little pollinating. <laughs> Of course, the kefir pears just started blooming here, and I tell you, the, the honeybees wasted no time you working those flowers. Absolutely, and, and that's one reason, uh, if you're using any type of pesticides, you're very careful during that pollination period, during that flowering period, right. to, to not use those. We really um, need to be thinking of alternatives to these pesticides, if we can. There is a real drive among big industry now to create what we call biopesticides which is a safer pesticide we can use to control the bad things that yes, affect us. right, but not destroy the beneficials. That's right. And what the homeowner, I think, needs to understand is if there are hives in your vicinity, typically those bees will find your, your fruit trees. That's very true. Yeah, you don't have to keep hives in your backyard for your fruit trees. That's right. And if you've got a little extra space, Always be careful about tearing up all the wild area because that's where your native bees live. Mm, yes. So those are things that need to be considerations for people who maybe don't have enough honeybees. Well, it's a real pleasure to have you here at the farm. It is wonderful to be here. Fantastic view. Your orchard you're developing uh, will be a real addition to this place. Well, I, I thank you so much for your expertise. Ah, thank you. Hey, are you looking for ways to attract more butterflies into your garden? Our friends at the Botanical Garden of the Ozarks tell us how. Whenever I choose plants for the garden, I'm always thinking about how can that help the pollinators? You know, the butterfly effect is part of the chaos theory. But the butterfly effect I'm talking about here is making sure that we have plenty of food for our little acrobats of the sky. You see, about one third of the food we eat depends on pollinators like butterflies. They come in beautiful colors and they dance and fly their way around the garden as they pollinate their day away. The Botanical Garden of the Ozarks helps us better understand how to create a habitat or ecosystem that's more friendly to butterflies. My name is Charlotte Taylor and I am the Executive Director of the Botanical Garden of the Ozarks here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I help to manage and run this beautiful facility. This is a great story of hardworking volunteers that 
thought we needed a botanical garden in northwest Arkansas. They negotiated with the city of Fayetteville to get this piece of land in 1994, incorporated, and then nothing happened for a long time except for people dreaming and thinking and hoping and raising money. And then not quite 10 years ago, we were able to open to the public to the facility that you see today, and we've been growing and growing ever since. When we first started, we didn't have any gardens, and a gentleman by the name of Carl Totemeyer came to Northwest Arkansas and he said, we need to build something. So they created this necklace where our gardens are placed around. Right now we have 12 uh, di distinctive gardens that are around this circle. On the circle we have a lot of weddings and events and whatnot, but we have 12 gardens, everything from a Japanese garden to a sensory garden to a vegetable garden to a children's gardens. So we have something here for everybody. My name is Lissa Morrison and we are at the Botanical Garden of the Ozarks. Behind me is the Butterfly Pollinator Garden and I am the lead gardener here in charge of design and uh, garden management. The Butterfly House we put up about five years ago and the Butterfly Garden went in three years ago. There's a great interest in butterflies and pollinators. Every year we see more and more people we are the only butterfly house in Arkansas, and so we have lots of visitors that come just to see our butterfly house. The best thing a home gardener can do is have flowers, nectar plants, food, from spring until fall. Some of the favorite plants of the butterflies are butterfly weed, milkweeds, all the milkweeds. This is the annual milkweed. It has flowers for all the butterflies, which provides nectar. It's also a host plant for the monarch butterfly. So it provides nectar and host for the eggs to be laid on. Some of the early bloomers would be creeping flocks. The asters for late food are really important. All butterfly gardens are going to need nectar plants. This is, lantana is a wonderful, easy nectar plant. All the butterflies love the lantanas. We have a whole group of volunteers that helps with our butterfly program. And these volunteers do the life cycle, some of them at their home. We call them butterfly nannies. Uh, they have, they come early in the spring with the first butterflies that we release in the house. In the house, we have the host plants and nectar plants. We have everything they need to do the complete cycle. I've been here for seven years, and the more flowers, the more pollinating flowers that we have in the garden, the more we see butterflies. So I, I lean toward looking for plants that we call, I call well-behaved natives. They've been here for eons, so they can hold up to the weather conditions regardless of the winter or the summer that we have. How bats stay busy in the garden at night? Stay tuned to find out. Some creatures actually prefer the dark. Take for instance bats, elusive little creatures. Some of us find them a little haunting, but these little flying mammals also do a lot for the environment. Well, welcome to War Eagle Cavern. It used to be referred to as Bat Cave. Every cave in the country is entirely different. You have stalactites, stalagmites, I mean, you're going to see that. But uh, ours is rather unique from the fact that, one, it has a huge natural entranceway. It was a huge underground river, and that's what kind of makes it a horizontal cave. We still follow that stream today. It's a live, active, growing cave. <laughs> that horizontal river, as it was digging its way out, sometimes the pressure would simply force it to dig straight up. Water takes the least resistance, so it would dig huge domes soaring up into the ceiling. 50, 60 feet or more. And what makes us really uniquely special is our bats. This one here, you can see he's hanging on by his little rear feet. Now, his legs are very short, 
And it's kind of unique on a bat here. He has to drop to fly. He can't run and take off like a bird. So for this bat to fly, he's actually going to release his claws, which are kind of spring-loaded. He will flip over, glide, and then fly. And when he lands, he's got to flip himself back upside down, grab a hold of the ceiling. The bat uh, is very misunderstood. Everybody's got, they're afraid of bats. They're, got, they're going to be vampires. They're going to get in your hair. You know, they're blood sucking. You know, they're, uh, they're not. Uh, they're very docile. Uh, they really don't care that we're even hardly around them on there. Uh, but the bat is very, very important to the environment. Not only do they eat insects, one little bat here goes out at night, he'll eat four to 5,000 mosquitoes in one night. So a number of years back, a lot of scout groups started building uh, bat houses so the bats would be around to take care of the mosquitoes that carry a West Nile. The same thing uh, with the Zika on there. The bats seem to be able to tolerate about anything the mosquitoes have and get rid of them. So bats are extremely helpful. War Eagle Cavern uh, has been a cave that people have known about for thousands of years, used first by Indians, outlaws, local explorers. Water coming through limestone simply purifies it on there, so it's a very good source of fresh water. Probably one of the reasons the moonshiners like coming into this cave to make moonshine whiskey. We estimate today there's probably well over 100,000 bats that use our cave. Little bats like this, they can live up to 25 years. And when they have babies, mom and bat has normally one baby per year. Sometimes they do have twins, but like any other mammal, that mother bat has to nurse that baby bat. It's a live birth, They're kind of unusual. Uh, they're hanging upside down when they give birth in these huge colonies on there. The small baby bat, when first born, is probably not much more the size of a thumbnail. Clings with the mother for maybe a week or two until it gets too big for the mother to carry. She will then leave her bat in this huge colony. And it's a very social arrangement. Only about a third of the females at any one given night will go out to feed. The other two thirds, they can provide warmth and security for those baby bats. And when that mama bat comes back, she can find her own baby bat. There's probably over a thousand different kinds of bats worldwide. Bats are extremely helpful. They range in all different sizes. Some pollinate. It's kind of nice. We have no mosquitoes around here, so those little bats do a good job in all the insects. So they're, they're, they're very good for you know, the environment and everything else. Got pests in your garden? Stick around for my helpful tips coming up next. It's important to be prepared when those bugs come knocking. Using organic or natural approaches to keep those pests at bay, well, it just makes your outdoor living space that much more enjoyable. As you may know, there are certain herbs and plants that contain essential oils that will actually deter those pesky bugs. By strategically placing some of these in your outdoor living space, well, you'll keep those bugs from hanging out with you. Citronella plants and lemongrass are popular options for pest control because they contain mosquito repelling qualities. In fact, citronella oil can be found in most outdoor insect repelling candles. But even some of the most common herbs like basil, sage, and lemon thyme also repel mosquitoes, houseflies, and other pests. Herbs that you're likely to have growing around the house, such as rosemary or mint, they repel fleas, ants, moths, and other pests. Not to mention, they'll keep your outdoor space smelling really fresh. And of course, one of the greatest benefits of having these herbs is, well, you can cook with them. They're delicious. If you're like me, you love to eat. The thing you want to keep in mind is that when you plant them in plastic containers, you want to make sure that that plastic is a food safe grade. You see why this is important is that when containers are not made of food grade quality plastics, well, some of those chemicals can leach into the soil, then they're taken up by the plants and then you eat them, which is not a good idea. You don't have to choose between controlling pests and having a beautiful outdoor space. You see, mixing ornamentals and pest control plants is a great way to incorporate some color or texture into your space while also repelling those pests. It's important to note that you'll also find that integrating some smaller containers like this with some of these aromatic herbs will also help keep the pests away. Pest control planters such as this are just one of many ways you can 
take care of those bugs in a natural and organic way. Give it a try. Up next, some tips to help protect some of your edibles during the frost. What do you think of this cabbage, Mr. Allen? I planted oh it at my school. Gosh, Gracie, that thing is huge. How did you grow such a big cabbage? I planted it early and gave it lots of love. Lots of love? Oh my gosh, it's fantastic. Good job, Gracie. Thank you. Now here's a tip for my prospective cabbage growers, whether you're young or old. You see, even though cabbage plants are considered a cold tolerant plant, vegetable, they can fall victim to sudden cold snaps. One easy way to keep them safe and warm through unexpected cold weather is to use a frost blanket. Unlike plastic sheeting, you can leave garden blankets on the plants without harming them. The lightweight material allows water, air, and sunlight through, all of which are vital for plant growth. Beyond the threat of a late frost, these blankets can also help protect your plants from other elements in the garden, such as birds, rabbits, other things that might want to munch on that delicious cabbage. Hope these are helpful tips. A little protection goes a long way. Take a look at this cabbage. Isn't it a beauty? One of the first questions people ask me when they see these big cabbages in my garden is, what are you going to do with all that cabbage? Well, there are a lot of recipes for it, but let's face it, cabbage is full of great things for us. You see, cabbages are rich in antioxidants, vitamin C, and other essential vitamins, making this vegetable one of the world's healthiest foods. At only 22 calories per cup, you can pretty much eat all you want. Here's a few ways that I would transform this big boy into a nutritious dinner. Coleslaw for your fish tacos or favorite barbecue. A healing cabbage soup. One of my personal favorites is the slow-cooked turkey cabbage roll. Mm-hmm. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store. I hope you found today's show helpful and discovered a few insights and solutions that may make your garden more beautiful. And hey, let's not forget about those little helpers that are working behind the scenes for us. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith.